Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Ben Danoon. You're watching Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about replacement theology, and in specifically, I want to talk to you about an organization that is called the Watchtower Society or the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Most people know them as Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the people that, that knock on doors normally on a Saturday. They dedicate their Saturdays to going out to spread uh, their, their beliefs and their, their, their doctrines uh, that they believe to be correct. And, uh, but before, before I get started in that, and, um, and oh, and by the way, and the, the reason I'm going to bring this, that I wanted to kind of go into this, I, I, my heart's desire is to help the people that are, um, they're called, like I said, they're known as Jehovah's Witnesses for, 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 for the sake of this video, because I have issues with, uh, using the name Jehovah because it's not the correct name for God's divine name. Um, but for the sake uh, uh, of that, let me list, we'll refer to them generally as witnesses, uh, uh, or JW is another expression that is called, that, that the people are called by. And, but my heart's desire is that any Jehovah's Witness or witness that would watch this video, I sincerely pray that you will take the time to watch it Take the time to search it by the Word of God and what I'm going to share with you because my heart is that God will bless you and that you will see that there is some major errors in the doctrine that your organization believes. Uh, I know that there is some truths in there because otherwise there wouldn't be anybody following the, the religion in the first place. And I know the Witness Organization, uh, the Watchtower Society as they're known, uh, really teaches against a lot of the organized religions. They teach against the Vatican. They teach against all the denominational systems. Uh, so this is where you get some truth in there, which causes people to be lured into that. Uh, but then when it comes down to doctrinal beliefs, like, for example, replacement theology, which they're very, they're very passionate about, Israel was replaced by uh, this organization. Uh, and so therefore, immediately it sends up the red flags everywhere. But not many people know how to, if you were to take and share your, your beliefs with them, they have, they're very, very well schooled in what they're taught. They spend hours on end learning how to debate every different type of uh, religion that's out there, how to counter what you're going to say, and, um, and then what they should say in response to you. So if you ever have had a witness come to your door trying to get you to take a look or do a Bible study, a free Bible study is what they call that, uh, you're in for a serious ride. And they normally come in pairs, uh, at least two. Sometimes if they get you to do a Bible study, they may come back even with more because the whole idea is, uh, and let me say this, they, they really believe that what they believe is true. So I want to be careful in what I'm saying here because it's not to hurt people's feelings because they do believe that it's, it's what they're doing is of God. But I know it's not of God because it doesn't match the Word of God. And it would not be right of me to sit here and hit the Vatican so hard and then let this organization that is really trying to gain converts all over the world to fall into this... Uh, this particular religion that is to me is totally off the Word of God. Uh, so anyhow, so my desire is that it will help you. I'm hoping that it will also help those that are out there that, that you've got family, you've got loved ones that are witnesses, or maybe you've got family or loved ones that are studying with witnesses and you're really concerned about this because they're beginning to believe some of the tactics, some of the things that are used and said in these meetings. I know them very well. My wife was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, uh, she, she spent her entire life in this organization. Uh, other than me praying for her, I had no influence on her leaving. Uh, she was extremely devout to this organization. Now, of course, I know that once she has, once she left the organization that she was in, everybody would say, no, she was not faithful. She was not that. They, they wanted to discredit you immediately because they don't want it to look bad on them. Uh, but I have debated many elders in my life, even before I met my wife, and they're sharp. 
Uh, I've never been defeated by one either, but they're very, very sharp. And most people are defeated by them because they don't know their own Bible well enough. And uh, my wife, though, when I met her, I was really surprised because she knew her word. She knew the Bible extremely well. And the thing was, what made it dangerous, though, she knew the organization extremely well. And she believed it. And she really believed that this was the, this was the right way, the avenue to God. And that's what witnesses do. They're not bad people. These are people that are, that are good people that mean well, you know. But we got to stay with the Word of God. Like I always tell you guys, stay with the Word of God. At any rate, though, because when I met my wife, she was a witness, and some people say, how did that happen? Well, <laughs> I think it's a divine appointment uh, because certainly God has, has brought us together beautifully uh, in, into one mind, one heart, and one accord. But the first book I ever wrote is called Israel, Are They Still God's People? In this book I wrote... Uh, the most, most of this book was written in secret, and uh, I, I actually record uh, a lot of the um, time I spent with, with a brother I call him Mark in the book. He was an elder up in northwest Florida, um, and his real name is Max. I won't say his last name, but uh, I really, really love this man. He was a very precious man, and um, I think he was originally a Methodist. And he ended up joining the organization uh, uh, later in life. I, and I can understand being discouraged with the Methodist church and, and, that, and their ways, but it just didn't go in the right direction. But, uh, but we, we had I studied with him because I'd promised my wife I would study, you know, before we got married. But I told her, I, I can't promise you that I'll be one, but I'll look at it open heartedly and honestly. And I did. I gave it one year. But the more I studied, the more I realized. These guys are way off the Word of God. Uh, and it caused a lot of conflict in our marriage in, in early on. And, uh, and I can't say that all, all my own thinking was right at the time either, you know. Uh, but by God's grace, He brought and united my family. And it was actually uh, because of one of the elders in the organization here in South Florida when my wife was attending down here that he preached on a message uh, and really hammered against women. And that's what really was a straw that broke the camel's back. It's what caused my wife to come out of the organization. Uh, I had been praying for her, and God had revealed to me that she was coming out, but I had no idea how, and I just left her be. Uh, I had promised her that if you want to, if that's what you believe, you want to believe that, I'll be right there. I'll support you. Uh, I'll even go with you. I won't be a part of it because I knew then that it wasn't right, but I didn't want to have uh, conflict there. But God brought her out Himself. And, uh, but I know there's a lot of people that struggle that are in this organization that are searching for truth. Their, their heart is wanting to know what's truth. And this is the hour. This is the time. And this video is for you. It's for you. It's for those that, that, that would want to break free. It's for those that maybe are devout witnesses, but you might be willing to stop and listen to the Word of God. It's for you as well that maybe God will help you. And, and my, my heart and my love is for you. I'm not against you. You know, I'm only against the system that has led you astray. And I know how that's like. I know how it feels. I, I've searched from one type of church to another and only to find out that the freedom is in Christ. It's in Yeshua or Jesus, as many people call Him. So at any rate, now... Uh, this book, by the way, you can buy it anywhere. You can go to our website, IsraelReturns.com. Uh, you can click on the thing about books. And I used to kind of think, well, it wasn't that great of a book. But, you know, this book has got better reviews than, than, than the book Yom Suf by far. And uh, one person wrote here, I was just pulled it up on the Internet. Uh, it's got a five-star rating. Uh, the thoughts expressed in this book by Stephen Denner are very interesting. I must confess, some of his insights are new to me as a Christian for more than 30 years. I can tell you I learned something new. When Danun takes the Lord's Prayer and proves that Jesus was speaking of Israel to be reestablished as a nation, it took me off guard for a moment. But when he proved it from Ezekiel, I was amazed, to, excuse me, to say the least. You will not regret getting this book. Uh, also, I should add, 
His knowledge proving the redemption of Israel is sure to silence some of the critics and perhaps change, change some points of view on the subject as well. Um, every comment has been positive about the book. Uh, I get emails about the book that people are just really delighted when they read it. And so, um, so I felt like that, and, and the book is written, like I said, in, in regards to the witness doctrines there. So let's, let's start off. First off, uh, I want to take you, and those of you that listen regularly, some of these things are just going to be things you're already aware of, but uh, this is designed for, for the doctrinal beliefs of the Watchtower Society. So if you just bear with me as well uh, as I go through this, I'm, I'm going to take you first to Zephaniah. And the reason I'm going to Zephaniah, that's for the witnesses that might listen or those that are studying with witnesses that want to know the truth. Let's first take a look at God's divine name because it's a big plumb line for the witness organization to say that what they were doing was re, uh, restoring God's name in His Word. And, uh, and that was a big issue about the Bible that they write. Uh, that they, they were doing God this favor by restoring his name to, to, to the Bible, whereas the King James Bible does not have it included in there. They use Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Um, and, of course, there's a big argument amongst them that the pronunciation of God's divine name is known and should easily be known. Uh, and so this kind of like the, uh, the premise of the organization and as well the 144,000, another doctrine of theirs, replacement theology, uh, that they are the ones that have replaced Israel, that, uh, that there is no longer, God is not going to restore Israel, and even though there is a nation, that does not matter. Um, many of these doctrines exist in there. They have a two-bride doctrine, very much like what Perry Stone teaches. So I'm going to touch on a little bit of everything of this. They also, they don't believe that there is a hell. Uh, we'll go into some of those things as well. And uh, in fact, quite, quite frankly, uh, if their doctrine was right, every sinner in the world ought to love going there because uh, if you don't believe in a hell, then there's no reason to worry about nothing. Uh, you know, it's like a free ticket. All right, let's go to God's divine name first. Now, this is only one of two scriptures, but I'll just use this one for sake, sake of time. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, that's God's divine name, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Now notice though, he says, wait, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord. All right, you're supposed to wait. Wait for what? Now his jealousy is fixing to be roused up. He's going to gather the nations. What for? For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord. And by the way, that Lord, that's the divine name that the witnesses believe that they have reestablished. They believe it was Jehovah. Well, then, of course, the Messianic groups came in and they said, no, that's not the right pronunciation. It's Yahweh. Uh, then we have Nehemiah Gordon, uh, which I'm acquainted with Nehemiah. We, we do know one another, and uh, Nehemiah believes that he's seen, seen that it's actually Yehovah uh, because he found one of the ancient uh, manuscripts, and he found vowels in there, and he believed that it was accidentally put in there. But regardless, and I actually have more respect for Nehemiah than I do any of the rest of, of the, of the ide ideology, but God has already said in his word, wait upon me saith the Lord. He tells you to wait. For he says, For then will I return to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of, we say Hashem as Jews, Hashem, God's divine name, and I'll just use the word Lord here, to serve him with one consent. Now, here's the thing. He tells you when that will happen, when he's going to restore the name. Well, it wasn't back in 1914. It wasn't back uh, in any of the earlier dates uh, that when, the, when the organization was first uh, founded. Um, it wasn't back in those times at all. He says that this, would, this will happen when he gets ready to rise up for the prey because his determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. 
This is when all the nations come against Israel. This is when God raises up out of his holy habitation to destroy those that have been, that have been trying to kill the Jewish people. Okay, so the name of God is not restored yet, but it will be restored. So at least I appreciate the fact that they were trying to do that, but it's not, that's not the right timing. All right, so this is why the Jewish people, the, it also is in the commandments of God, take not the Lord thy God's name in vain. In other words, if you don't know how to say it and you're just saying any name, you're taking his name in vain, you know, because you're not saying it correctly. And it troubles me. In fact, this, this, my friend, is what Moses asked God. He said, they will say, unto, uh, they will, they will say what is his name? Mashimo. He says, what do I tell them? Okay? And, and God says to Moses, he says, tell them, I, 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 I am, or I will be that which I, I will be, or that which I am. Now, now, it's kind of interesting. I have to give the witnesses credit there. They do know that it is a future tense. Well, Yeshua was the fulfillment of that. But here's something, though, that will blow you away. Do you know that... Um, do you know that they never asked Moses what his name was? This has never been fulfilled. But the, this, and, and, the, and the thing is, now he does tell them later what his name is, but what's, what's kind of interesting is he does not, at that time, he does not tell them what his name is. And so I find that kind of interesting. He doesn't reveal his name back then. I mean, he, does, he, tells, he tells the children of Israel what God's divine name is later, but they never ask him that question, what is your name? So God only says to him, I will be that which I am. That's really the best way to translate Ihaye Asha Ihaye. Now, granted, also keep in mind the people that translated the New World uh, Order Bible. Now, they say that the names were withheld, uh, uh, the New World Translation, that is, uh, that no one knows who really uh, translated it. It was kept secret because they didn't want any notoriety. Uh, but it's real easy to go back and pull the court records because there was a, a case brought against them. And, uh, and there was only one man on that entire board uh, that claimed to know Greek and Hebrew and was unable uh, to be able to even translate a simple uh, Hebraic phrase. So there was no credible scholars on there. And that was one of the big issues. And I think that's probably why they kept it secret. Of course, there, there, there's all kinds of things you can find out on that. Like I said, that's, I think it's important to note, though, that they did not have any credible scholars. Um, but, of course, and again, a lot of the translations we have today, it's not that they weren't credible scholars, but there's also an agenda as well, uh, nonetheless. So that's true, too. Uh, Charles Taze Russell is the, is the founder of the Watchtower organization. And what's really kind of interesting is that uh, although the organization turned to a, a replacement theologist belief, in the beginning, he never believed that. He felt like that when Israel went back to their homeland, uh, that, they, that the 144,000 would become from a, a spiritual remnant of Jews that would come out of Israel itself. And even tried to go and witness to them, but they would not receive him. And it was after that that the doctrine actually changes. Um, but anyway, and, and of course, the organization began in 1879. And, um, and also, to give you a little bit of a foundation, uh, there's all kinds of people that have different doctrines on the 144,000, but the witness organization believes there are two classes of people. A lot of times people get it mixed up in the doctrine that they have. They'll say, oh, the Jehovah's Witness, they're the people that think they're just 144,000. Well, there's not a whole lot of spaces, and they got a lot of people that have joined it, so there's very few going to get to go. That's not really what the doctrine believes. They believe that the 144,000 are the anointed class, as they call it, and they actually will reside with Christ in heaven and rule from heaven. And then the, the other class uh, are the people that will rule here on the earth. And so they believe it's two different groups of people altogether. Really a mixed up doctrine because 144,000 is clearly Israel. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, has nothing to do uh, with a spiritual Israel whatsoever. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit here. I mentioned to you, though, the Lord's Prayer. So let me just kind of share something with you on that here. Um, I was 
um, I want to say it was with Brother Max uh, that I actually had this conversation with. We, this is when, in early on, when he was trying to uh, show to me that God's, uh, the reason, the, 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 the crux of the, of the organization was to restore the name of um, God back to, 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 the, to, the, to what it should be. So they used the name Jehovah. Uh, and this is, was the whole thing. And he took me to the Lord's Prayer to prove the point. And in the Lord's Prayer, just from paraphrasing, we know it begins off, you know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, now, the word hallowed is it's actually the word should be sanctified. Sanctify your name. Now, and they recognize that. And I remember Max telling me, he said, Steve, how do you sanctify God's name? And I said, well, I already know how. He said, well, no, I'm going to tell you how. I thought that was kind of interesting. I already know, but he's going to tell me. Okay, so all right, I'll listen. He said, the way you sanctify God's name is restoring it back into the Bible. He said, where the church took out the name of, uh, of God's name out of the Bible and they just substituted it with Lord, he said, that's what we were doing. We were re-putting it back in. We were sanctifying his name to where God's name is now in the Bible the way it should be. I said, are you serious, Mags? You believe that's what God, that's how God was sanctifying his name by reestablishing his name back into the word there? He said, that's exactly what it was. I said, okay then. All right, now, now this is not for humor's sake, but I said, let's take and look at the word of God and see what God says about sanctifying his name. So I took him to Ezekiel. That's where I want to take you right now. Let's, let's turn to Ezekiel. Chapter 36, I believe it is, is where we're going to go. And um, and I said, it's funny because God actually deals with this subject as well. And uh, so, see, this is the, this is the, uh, the, the premise of their doctrine. Let's take a look at what God had to say. Now, he's dealing with Israel. And you've got to keep in mind, we're going to come back to the part about Israel being divorced too. Um, but God is dealing with Israel here, and we get into chapter 35. He says, uh, verse 8, You shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon uh, be coming, uh, for behold, I am for you. I will turn you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, the house of Israel, all of it. And the city shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. And I will multiply upon you man and beast and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will cause you to inhabit, uh, excuse me, be inhabited as in the former times. Okay, now you got to keep in mind, this is a promise that and he's speaking of the house of Israel here. They've not even gone... Uh, I mean, they had just gone into exile at this point here. So he's, he's talking about he's going to bring them back. Now, the house of Israel, even to this day, has still not come back. A few remnants of them have. Yes, there have, we have had the tribe of Manasseh. Parts of the tribe of Manasseh have come home from India. But not all of them as of yet. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later as well so you understand how that works there. Um, and oh, by the way, I know a lot of witnesses don't like the fact that I wear a, a yarmulke or kippah, as we call it there. Uh, maybe this will help you on that. Paul said, I became all things to all men, saving that I might win some. So you have to understand, my desire is to my own people, the Jewish people. And although I know it's not a requirement of God, I do it for the sake of my people, that they may listen as well. And you never know if they happen to be dropping in and catch this video as well. So just so you understand what the purpose of that is. Um, so at any rate, though, we find here, as you go on down a little bit further, though, uh, let's go to verse 15. Um, Neither will I allow insult to the nations to be heard any more against thee, uh, nor shalt thou bear the reproach of peoples any longer, nor shalt thou cause thy nation to stumble any more, says the Lord God. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their way and by their doings. They were Their way was before me as the uncleanliness of a menstruous woman. So I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. 
And I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way, according to their doings. I judged them. And when they came to the nations in which um, uh, they came, they profaned my holy name. All right. So if, if, if Yeshua, if Jesus says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, you know, sanctify your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So in, or, in order for God's kingdom to come, in order for God's will to be done, God's name has got to be sanctified. And it can't be, it, the kingdom of God cannot come until his name is sanctified. Now we're reading right here in Ezekiel, and the house of Israel is already scattered because he's saying they're scattered because of what they did. And here we are now, nearly 2,800 years later, and, and the house of Israel is still scattered. Because the Jews that are in Israel today, that's the house of Judah. That's not the house of Israel. Okay? So keep that in mind. But God has just said here in his word that he will bring them home. Not a spiritual Israel. He's talking about the house of Israel. All right? So keep that in your mind. So he says there, they profaned my holy name. Okay, so if God says, sanctify your name, so the name had to become unsanctified somehow, and how did it become unsanctified? First with the house of Israel. How did it become unsanctified or profaned? In that men said of them, these are the people of the Lord. And that's God's divine name. He, they use it as divine name. In other words, he would say, as, as the witnesses would say, these are the people of Jehovah, and they are gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations into which they came. So how did God's name get profaned? It got profaned because God had made a promise to Israel that she would be in that land, and he'd give it to them as an inheritance. And when they were driven out, it's as if God didn't keep his word. Now, of course, the witness mentality argument on this is, well, they sinned, and God said, if you sin, this is going to happen to you. But God also swore in his word that they would be there, that they would have a remnant that would always be there. And now God is addressing what's happening. Okay, so, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Ka Omer Adonai Yehovah. Okay, that's how you say, thus saith the Lord. And you got to know how to say that name because if you don't know how to say it, it ain't going to hold water. I do not do this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. Now God's going to sanctify his name. How's he going to do it? which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will sanctify my great name which was profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations shall know that I am Yehovah, says the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified, how? In you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and I will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's how God sanctifies his name. That, now you have learned how it became unsanctified and now you've learned what uh, Yeshua, what Jesus' prayer means. When Jesus says, pray like this. He taught the world to pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, sanctify your name. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. You know, or thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what were you doing? You were praying. And to this day, even if you're a uh, witness of the Watchtower organization, every time you pray that prayer, you are asking for God to restore Israel, the house of Israel, to their homeland. Bet you didn't know that. So, you know, it's funny. I mean, the Word of God is true, okay? The Word of God's true. There's no way out of it. Now, uh, maybe I should go ahead and take you through some scriptures here. Um, 
And in the book here that I wrote, Israel is still God's people, I really get into all this. I'll just share with you some of the scriptures I have in here. Uh, there's so, so many scriptures. Um, okay, let's see here. Isaiah chapter 11, a beautiful scripture here. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand against us again uh, the second time, able to marry the remnant that believed in him. He said, but Jehovah God had to divorce Israel first before he could marry them. I said, are you serious? He said, yes. I said, do you realize all the commandments of God that you break by doing that? The Bible clearly says that a son cannot marry his father's wife. That is a major sin of God, and it is, oh gosh. I think I actually have these even marked in this book here. Um, but it is, here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 30. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover, discover his father's skirt. You can't do it. I mean, it is against the laws of God for, for, for him to do that. Um, and not to mention the laws of marriage and divorce that even Yeshua himself speaks about. He said that a man is not supposed to be married unless, unless her husband is dead. You know, you can, in other words, you know, when, when Jesus is dealing with the laws of marriage and divorce, and we know that he says because of the hardness of heart, he said divorce was not so from the beginning, but because of the hardness of the, the heart, Moses suffered you a bill of divorcement to be able to put away your wives. But Jesus says, but I say unto you, and I'm just paraphrasing this, but I say unto you, he that marries her that is put away, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to com commit adultery and of course he and he that marries her that's been put away because of the adultery causes then he's an adultery all right so now if you're telling me that God has divorced Israel and that he did it on the grounds of spiritual adultery and then Yeshua comes along and takes the bride for himself of Israel and you said that he had to divorce both the good ones and the bad ones Yeshua, one, according to Deuteronomy, can't marry his father's wife, and neither can he take and uh, marry a woman that's been divorced that's committed adultery if it's somebody else's wife that committed adultery because then he's guilty because he takes her as his wife. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you got a big mess with this. But if, see, because remember, the other thing is, and this is another issue you run into. Israel, even the Jews, the remnant of Jews that end up believing Yeshua to be the, 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 to be the Messiah. What did Paul say to them? I espouse you a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul said, I espouse you a chaste virgin to Christ. He's talking about the remnant of Israel right there that's believing. Now, how can Paul take God's bride and give her to another man if Unless this man, Jesus, this man, Yeshua, is actually God manifested in a human body called the Son of God. Then it's not he's given it to somebody, given God's wife to somebody else, which would break the law of God. See, God won't go against his own law. Now, I know that's kind of tough when you hear me say this thing, but that's, that's the way God is. God can't break his own law. He's got to maintain his own law. Now, the, you know, they asked they ask Yeshua the question. Yeah, this is something I thought was interesting. I think it's in the book of John. Um, he says, uh, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Yeshua says, how long have I been with you and you don't even know me? Um, I'm going to see if I can't pull that up real quick here. So, we know that it's not two different gods. Yeshua is not an angel uh, come down. Uh, now, if you want to use the term as far as the word messenger, certainly he was, he was a messenger. But he also claimed to be the one that, that spoke to Abraham. Uh, and, and so, uh, oh gosh, we, we can go in a million different directions on that. I, I'm hoping I can, I can let, me, let me 
Paul will pause for one second to cover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set an ensign for the nations uh, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, wait a minute now. We know this is not, this had not happened at that, back when Isaiah wrote this, because the house of Judah never was scattered until, and he separates the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And he's going to gather them both back. See, the outcast of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. You, you have to remember now. After the death of Solomon, then the nation was split into two. And 723 BCE, that you know, they go into exile, the house of Israel does, and then 70 AD, Judah goes into exile. So this scripture has got to be fulfilled. All right. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not, in, uh, not vex Ephraim, because Ephraim represents the house of Israel. All right. Now, hmm, it's going to get better, guys, I'm telling you. Let me share with you so you understand. Now, see, God has promised to restore both houses of Israel back to their homeland. Now, either God keeps his word or God's a liar, and it's up to you to make that decision. I'd be very careful, though, before I call God a liar, because you will not like his reaction to that. Uh, but let me just share with you something here. Let's take and go to um, Zechariah 12. And by the way, I understand Hebrew, so... Uh, you don't believe what, what it says here. I'll tell you what it says in Hebrew as well. So either way you want to do, but um, let's take Zechariah chapter 12 and let's go to verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. So, what do we have in Israel today? Now, I don't, I don't think the witnesses have joined in on the DNA uh, scandal of the Khazarian theory, but even if you did, that has been totally debunked. But God promised to bring back the house of Judah first. And why? Because you have to remember, it's the house of Judah that was there when Yeshua came, when Jesus, as for, in case you don't know his name uh, in the Hebraic language, Yeshua actually comes into, into um, the land of Israel. And you have to remember, the Messiah was promised for all 12 tribes. This is another reason why he has to bring the house of Israel back. This is if God didn't keep his promise to them. They were promised a Redeemer, and the Redeemer wasn't there, or excuse me, the house of Israel wasn't there when he came. So therefore, God is going to keep that promise. That's why you see the valley full of dry bones and stuff. That doesn't represent the Jews in the Holocaust. That represents the house of Israel. That because they weren't there in the time of the Messiah to, to believe him or to reject him, whichever the case would have been, they wanted to be a part of that. You know, but they didn't get to. So they, they, you see it in Ezekiel. They said, our hope is lost. But God gives a promise that he will resurrect them so that they can hear the gospel of Yeshua. So no, their hope is not lost. Okay? So anyway, hang on. Throat gets dry. I do a lot of talking like that. I've done a lot of talking today as it is. I did an interview with uh, David Starr Magazine today, so it was really very lengthy conversation. So I've got, don't have a lot of voice here. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to promise not to shout or anything either because I know witnesses like a nice calm, calm service there. Uh, they're not much into anointings and things of that nature. Um, so, so at any rate, though, Zechariah 12, he, he brings back the house of Judah. All right. And so that's what's got to happen first. That's God's word. That's not mine. OK, now. If you go down to verse 10, actually verse 9, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, Israel's in her homeland. Not all of Israel. We know that. It's the house of Judah's in their homeland. Now, is it biblical? Because you've got to remember, all those Orthodox Jews you see over there, those Levites, 
they're the Kohanim from the families of the Kohanim and the Levites and stuff. This here are the Pharisees that were back in the times of Yeshua. In fact, it's the only group that has maintained their identity for the last 2,000 years are, 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 are the Pharisees. The Jews all through Europe that were killed in the Holocaust and stuff. These are from the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin. And we read here that God even shows you the time frame of when they come home. Uh, and let's just read, let's read on down then from verse, or right after verse 7 going to verse 8. In that day shall the Lord de defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall, uh, uh, shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, a as the angel of the Lord before them. Okay, now we have know in 1967, what a miraculous things that happened there in 1948 as well. I mean, you can't deny the fact of the supernatural intervention that happened with a military that was surrounded by overwhelming force against them. And yet God delivered them. Even to this day, even in the battle in Gaza, the, only, the, 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 the Hamas people actually reported they could tell the God of Israel was fighting for them because they would fire rockets off and for some reason they would steer off and go into the ocean. Uh, really interesting things that we see here. Now he says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy the nations that come against Jerusalem. Again, remember Zephaniah, when we talked about it a minute ago, when God's going to restore his name. It's when he is his fire of his jealousy. He comes down. He's coming for vengeance. All right? And he says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. Now, I know good and well that the word in Hebrew is is thrust through. I don't know if Jews or the witnesses know that, but it's thrust through. But nonetheless, the ones that pierced him are going to look upon him. Now, I know a lot of times you guys want to say this was fulfilled back 2,000 years ago. Oh, no. This is when God is, is going to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. If this scripture was fulfilled back 2,000 years ago, then why didn't God destroy Rome when they came against Israel? Think about that. He didn't, did he? No, in fact, Titus ransacked Israel, burned the temple, tore all the stones down. Well, if this scripture would have been fulfilled then, and it shall come to pass in the day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, God would have been obligated to destroy Titus and his army. And he used the whole Babylonian Empire to do it, the eastern leg as well. There were all kinds of Arabs that were part of that, just like today they're trying to bring all the Arab nations against Israel again. And they're going to come against Israel. But God is going to destroy those nations. Okay, so keep that in mind. So now we know for a fact, though, this had nothing to do with 2,000 years ago. Just by that verse, verse 9 in chapter 12 here. Verse 11, In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as in the morning of the Hadra... Hadadrim, Hadarimon, in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and, his, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart, which, by the way, both these men are from the tribe of Judah. Okay? The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart. That's the Levites. And by the way, you're also seeing a Orthodox Jewish custom here when they are mourning the families are mourning apart with the wives separated from the husbands. Okay, so you're dealing with Jewish customs of today. So God clearly is identifying what you're seeing in Israel. All right? And all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Oh, I'm sorry, we skipped Shemai. Uh, and, the, uh, and, and the family of Shemai apart, and their wives apart. Shemai is from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, Without going into this, if you look at the story of David, David's life perfectly types Yeshua in all these things. Uh, when David leaves Israel, he goes up on the Mount of Olives, he weeps over Jerusalem. Yeshua wept over Jerusalem. In fact, in the Jehovah, uh, excuse me, in the Witness Doctrine, the Watchtower Doctrine, when Yeshua weeps over Jerusalem, um, this is one of your strong points that, you, that, that you're taught. Uh, uh, let me say, I want to make sure I say that with love too, you know, because I do love these people. I mean, I've got 
uh, personal family that are, that are witnesses. I love them dearly. I really do. And my heart's desire is that their eyes will come open. But anyway, uh, let me just share this with you. One of the big doctrinal issues that you're taught is that when Yeshua, Jesus, when he stood up there on the Mount of Olives and wept over Jerusalem, that this is where God divorced him. Now, this is what Brother Max told me. And I like to call him brother because I just love him. I really love him. He's a very old gentleman now. And I pray that he'll get to see this video. Um, but at any rate, though, what happened is, I'll read to you, and I know it by memory from the King James Version Bible. It says that uh, when he wept over Jerusalem, it says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. Your house is left to you desolate until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Max was telling me when we got into this uh, subject one day, because I, I asked him, I said, Max, I said, I don't understand. It's written in the book, Israel, are they still God's people? I said, Max, when did, when did God ever divorce Israel? You say that Israel was divorced the second time and it was the final time. Now, I could go back and see where God divorced Israel the first time, but if you go to that chapter, right down in the same chapter, God turns right back around and says, I am married to you, O Israel. So, he said he divorced them, but then he says, I'm married to you. So you could tell he was angry, but then he also said, I'm married to you. Now, I won't get into Vashti and stuff like that. I know that's too deep for you guys right now. I want to try to keep it simple for, for those that would be listening. Now, but Max said, that's the scripture. When, you, when Jesus is standing over Israel, God divorces Israel at that point. I said, but Max, that doesn't make sense. I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is the scripture you guys use for that God divorced Israel. I said, for one, you believe that Jesus is the son of God. He's, you actually believe he's an angel. Uh, he's separate. Uh, and if that, uh, you know, it's kind of like they believe two gods, but they believe that Jesus is a little God. Uh, they do not believe in Trinity. And, you know, in my opinion, the only way Trinity is accurate is uh, if you have one God that has manifested himself. And he could do more than just a trinity in that regard. But God can manifest himself however he wants. And I know there's a lot of people that believe that way. I know some maybe other people have a different opinion. But I don't believe in multiple gods at all. And uh, because God says clearly, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God. And he uses the, the, the Yehovah or the divine name of God there. The Lord thy God is one God. It's not two. It's not three. He's just one God. But at any rate, I know that can be confusing as well. I said, uh, if God was going to divorce Israel and you believe it's two different people, what, what in the world do you have Jesus coming down here divorcing Israel on, on God's behalf if he's a different guy altogether? And I said, and secondly, if he was going to divorce Israel, he would have used the word you're being divorced, but he doesn't. He said, your house is left to you desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. All right. Now, this is for my brothers and sisters that listen on a regular basis. And this is also for the witnesses. The first time I ever heard that Matthew's gospel was written in Hebrew originally, and that was the original ancient document, was, was from several different uh, uh, witness elders in the, in the Watchtower organization. And they would tell me that we actually use the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew version of the scriptures there to be, able to, uh, to, to be able to translate our particular Bible. And, and for a long time, I just didn't believe that because I'm like, I've never heard of that. And they said, well, we were able to have some of the brethren got to be, got to see this privately because you just are not, you know, people can't go see it. Not just anybody can see it. I had no idea that you could get a copy of it at that, at that time anyway. And, um, and it, it was actually Nahami Gordon that caused me to want to get a copy of it once Nahami had actually, and Nahami literally went and seen those ancient documents that we do have. And he says that the one that George Howard wrote uh, that he brought out is indeed the same thing. And so because the witnesses really were, felt very strongly about this uh, Hebraic translation, and now I have to agree with the witnesses, they were right. 
This is definitely far more accurate than the King James Version, and sadly to say, it's far more accurate than what they have as well. Let me tell you what he says in here in Matthew chapter 23, verse 38 and 39, which happens to be that same scripture. Yeshua actually says, therefore you will leave your houses desolate. Remember when he wept? Let me, let me back up. Verse 37, actually. Truly I say to you that all these things will come upon this generation. I'm actually reading verse 36. And upon Jerusalem who kills the prophets and removes those who are sent. How many times I wish to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you would not. I want you to think about that one for a minute. Here Jesus is standing there and he's saying how many times I would have gathered your children and you would not. He doesn't say anything about, oh, my father would have gathered your children. Just a little thought there. Verse 38, therefore you will leave your houses desolate. A couple of things that happens here. One, he shows that they're going to go into exile. Secondly, it's also an analogy. He's showing that their hearts will be desolate. He wasn't even talking about the temple. Although the temple, he does say in another place that it would not be one stone left upon another. But he says, you will leave your houses desolate. So even the fact that their heart would not be filled with the Holy Ghost because they were not believing what he said. But he wanted them to, but they didn't. But then he goes on to say, truly I say to you, you will not see me henceforth until you will say, Blessed is our Savior. He doesn't say blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, but either way is okay. The whole point is, is until. And it is actually here in Hebrew, Be'emet ani omer lachem lo harani mechen ve'elav ad. See, ad is the word for until. Until. Until you, in other words, you say not just one of them, you say collectively as a people, as a nation, until you say, see, sorry, I'm getting a little excited. Baruch ma Yeshua nu. Blessed is he that, 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 that's, that's, that is our Savior. Isn't that beautiful? Not that he came in the name of Hashem or the name of Jehovah, but blessed is, blessed is he, excuse me, blessed is our Savior. So, nonetheless, so using that as a divorce scripture is rather, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, here's what the other issue that came up. Now, this one I didn't learn from, from Max, but I learned from another elder uh, who happens to be a very, very dear friend. I, I love him to death. But um, he began to talk to me about um, there being two brides. Now, that blew me completely away. And as we're doing this, by the way, we'll get into more scriptures that proves that Israel was, was chosen of God, meant to be in their homeland, uh, without any question, I'll I'm going to take you to a lot of different scriptures on that. But I, I want to share with you, uh, because, you know, you, you got to keep in mind, the, the Watchtower organization has to change their doctrine from time to time. Uh, even recently, they changed the 144,000 doctrine. Uh, as well. Uh, there's always a change in the doctrine itself because, um, you know, and, and in some of the doctrines, you know, people, they pick on them pretty hard like the, was it 1975? They believed that everything would come to an end and it d didn't. But I, I see that in all kinds of different people, religions and, and everything else. Uh, most, most of the times it's just individuals that set dates and things. So I'm not really going to pick on them on that there, but they have set dates many times, didn't come to pass, and so now they quit setting dates. So at least they've learned from that. But the big issue is, though, is their doctrine constantly changes. Now, normally what they'll tell you 
is that as more light comes out, uh, then they have to re, you know, change it because it's more revelation. I do not agree with that at all because God doesn't change. And the other reason I don't agree with that is because they believe that the, uh, th there has been uh, what they call the, um, or they had, what is it, eight men, I believe, in Brooklyn. Uh, that are the, are the main leaders of the organization. And in their opinion, and I've had this told to me directly, that these men, these leaders, are the same, they hear from God, just like the early apostles. Well, my problem with that is, though, is that if they were like that, then why do they change? Because I can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and nowhere, any time, do you have to change or alter the Word of God whatsoever. It has been perfect all the way down through the ages. It tells exactly what will happen by the very end, and we don't have to change anything. So if the men in Brooklyn that are the, that are the overseers of this organization, which they are compared, I've actually been told they are considered prophets. Uh, it's really messed up then, because no, they, they have changed the organization's policies and rules all along uh, uh, after uh, Charles Taze Russell, uh, then you had another man that came in, and, and the organization has constantly changed. So I do want to read to you a couple of excerpts, though, that I have. Uh, there actually, there's, there's several things marked in the book here. Uh, where I cite it, I'll tell you exactly what page, where you can get the documentation at um, from their own writings. And I do that because I think that's important that you're aware of some of the things that are written in the, in the Watchtower organization. This one here... Uh, is, <clears throat> is, is what they actually wrote. Uh, it's called, it's, let's see, it's in a book called A Kingdom of Priests. It's an excerpt from there. It says, those not my people. And this is the quotation that they write in this book here. Uh, Jehovah let it plainly be known that he was no longer the God and spiritual husband of the apostate house of Israel. The Jeho this Jehovah did when he permitted the, the capture of Israel, capital, and city, Samaria, by the Assyrians in 740 BCE. Thus, that house of Israel was no longer his people. It was, as he said, Loami, or not my people. Yeah, of course, Loami does mean not my people. Like a divorced wife, that people went off into exile in Assyria. That spiritually adulterous house of Israel had despised the opportunity offered to it uh, in the Mosaic Law covenant of becoming uh, to Jehovah a kingdom of priests, a, uh, a kingdom of priests. Now that was published in Those Not My People. It's actually it's actually inside one of the books that uh, one of their I forget the name of that book there. Um, it's called Ralph. Let's see. I, no, I do. Have, I'm sorry. I have it right here. Um, this was, I'm sorry, this was actually from a 2008 Watchtower CD, uh, and these were quotes that I actually pulled off of that 2008 Watchtower CD when I was writing the book. Uh, but anyway, I'm sitting there reading that, and of course, I've already been over with you where God promises to restore the house of Israel back to the homeland after he scattered her, and of course, that's how God sanctifies his name, is returning the house of Israel to their homeland. So, automatically, Whoever actually wrote this in this organization, and the organization permitted this to be part of their doctrinal teachings, is totally, 100%, in contrary against the Word of God. And you've already seen that in this video thus far. Now, uh, this is also from the same video. As we can see by the above quote in Watchtower publication, Jehovah's first divorce of Israel occurred in 740 BCE. That's, that's their opinion on that. Now, they had another uh, excerpt in there called Loyal, Loyalty to, to a Marriage Covenant Moves God to Mercy. And this is what it states here, quote, In the face of that, only Jehovah's all-excelling mercy permitted his marriage covenant with all Israel to continue on for centuries after Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 BCE. But the breaking point came in 33 CE when the nation rejected the Messiah Jesus and had him slain outside Jerusalem's wall. Then the nation was divorced from marriage relationship with Jehovah God. Does Jewish history since then prove that? Yes. Mercifully, though, Jehovah let individual Jews who believed in the Messiah 
Jesus renew their relationship with him in a new covenant, the covenant mediated by the Messiah, Jesus. Um, another quote here I want to bring to you is, the bridegroom and bride turn attention to family rearing. Uh, and this is from the Watchtower uh, a magazine dated uh, on the uh, September 15, 1967. Uh, Jesus Christ is the bridegroom, uh, John 3, 28, 29. He is spiritual, immortal, in heaven. And they quote 1 Peter 3, 18, 1 Timothy 6, 14, and 16. Who is his bride and who? what kind of person is she? Well, the Bible says the Christian congregation is his bride. Of course, she is no individual woman, but is a co uh, composite bride, an organization made up of people. A bride who is to marry a spiritual bridegroom must be spiritual, and she is such a uh, being, uh, the Israel of God, or the spiritual Israel. Um, and one more I want to quote to you, and then we'll go into the, we'll go into the actual Word of God and how it refutes what these, are, these statements. This one's called, Now Jehovah is, uh, is the Husband. In the 20th century parallel of this uh, repentant remnant of the spiritual Israelite was released from Babylon the Great in 1919 CE. Down till then, these spiritual Israelites had given over balanced importance to the Messiah Jesus and his bride, the Christian congregation, but now they began showing more appreciation for Messiah's heavenly father, Jehovah God. His relationship as a heavenly husband to spiritual Israel had been left out of the picture. Practically since 1892 CE, his new covenant was misunderstood. Now, the reason I quoted these two particular places here, this was in 1967, both of them, is because in one of these, the first one here, dated on September the 15th, um, they clearly make Jesus Christ as the bridegroom. Uh, but in the other article, they make Jehovah God. Uh, as the heavenly husband to spiritual Israel. Now, this brought on with, with the brother that I know, uh, or the friend, I should say, the, the dear friend that I know uh, here locally, who, who very close with him, even to this day, um, I should say very friendly, we're, fr we're friends together. We really got into a debate over this because when I, when I discovered this, uh, we we begin to dis, we begin to talk about this. Actually, I think is even with Max. Maybe no no no, it wasn't Max. It, it was the brother here locally. I said, wait a minute. I said, who is the husband? Is what I want to know. I said because you got you've got God being married to Israel, and now you have Jesus being married to Israel. And uh, he said, well, it's two brides. Now, this is actually taught in the organization as well. It's a two-bride doctrine. And uh, he said, Jehovah is the husband of Israel. And Jesus is, uh, when, when, when he says, when God divorced Israel, then Jesus took up the marriage covenant from there. Now, believe it or not, Perry Stone actually teaches this as well. And I didn't know Perry Stone actually taught this. It's kind of funny because Perry Stone's secretary or, uh, had actually asked me would I send him this book. And, uh, of course, needless to say, I never heard from him again because I addressed that issue in here. Because here's the issue that you're dealing with. How in the world can you scripturally make that work? Now, you might say, what do you mean? Okay, look. For one, we know that God is restoring Israel anyway. God says to Israel, I am married unto you. He, yeah, he said to the house of Israel, I divorced you, but the same chapter, he says, I'm married unto you. So then he promises to restore Israel back to her homeland. It's all through the Bible. I've already, we've already listened to many scriptures already. Uh, we know in Ezekiel 36, he says that. We know in Isaiah 11, he says that. We know in Hosea's prophecy, he says this. It's all over the Bible. Zechariah promises to bring the house of Judah back home. Um, scripture after scripture after scripture proof. We know that, all right? But this is what really brings the confusion in. If God is married to Israel, 
And let's just say, for argument's sake, this is what I did with, with, with the friend that I have here. I said, for argument's sake, let's say that God did divorce them. Let's say that he actually divorced Israel. And we'll say that Jesus was the one that came and brought the divorce papers to Israel and say, okay, we're done with you. That's for argument's sake. I don't believe that, but for argument's sake. I said, now you run into a major problem with that. So, because I asked him, I said, are you telling me then that what Jesus did then was after God had divorced Israel, now Jesus is able to take and marry them? He said, no. He said, they all, he, Jesus was, all right, all right, so all right, now I got the scripture here. In John chapter 14, verse 9, this is where Jesus saith unto him, uh, he's talking, he's talking here to Philip. Philip asked, uh, had asked the question, show us the Father. And it would, it would satisfy us. And so, um, let me just pull up the whole thing on that there. Uh, Thomas said, let me see, let's back up. This is John chapter 14, verse 5. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith uh, unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Now that's fascinating. He tells them they know him and they've seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. In other words, satisfy us, and we'll be content. Now he just gets to telling me you've already seen him, and now you ask him, well, show him to us. That's kind of funny. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Wow. Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou, then show us the Father. See, what was it? God is an invisible spirit that cannot be seen. And it was God himself. It was Yehovah, the Jehovah that you guys call him. He was living inside of that human body making himself known to the world. The fullness of God dwelt in him. All right? Now, we can get into all kinds of things. I, of course, I know one of the favorite scriptures that you guys have, you can't stand that John 1. You've had to retranslate that, and you talk about uh, some kind of issues there that don't really exist. Uh, but that's neither here nor there right now. We'll get into that maybe a little bit here. But let me, let me just share with you as well, though. Re the, the big issue about this divorcing Israel and one, we know is unscriptural because Yeshua never divorced Israel and he doesn't have any right to divorce Israel for God's sake anyway. Uh, no son can go put away a, a, another man's wife for, for him. But, you know, we, we couldn't really go that one with the law. But when the law of God says that a son cannot have his father's wife, Jesus is not going to break God's word, period. I mean, that settles that period. I don't care. You can look into the adultery side of it and say, well, the remnant, they weren't committing adultery, uh, so therefore he had a right to take her. No, if a son cannot have his father's wife. That's the word of God. God will not break his own word. So anyway, that kind of we kind of deal with that right there. Now, um, and, and if, you, if you have any questions, write me. Just write me a letter. Israel Returns. At, uh, actually, uh, write, you can write me personally. Stephen Ben Noon at AOL.com. You can reach me that way. B-E-N-N-U-N -N -N at AOL.com. The Stephen is the E-V-E-N, by the way. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting, and then we're going to come back and proving, we're going to prove some issues here about still about Israel, is the hell issue. Um, and in a way, it kind of reminds me of the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. The Catholics believe, okay, you won't necessarily go to hell, you go to purgatory, and, and you give enough money, and we'll get you out. Now, I give the witnesses credit, though. Witnesses are not about money. That's something that really attracts the organization, or people to their organization, because uh, they're, or at least from the outside, it doesn't appear that they're about money, which... They're not, but once you become really loyal to it, they would like for you to will your estate and anything else to the organization. Um, but that's different. A lot of churches do that. The Catholic Church is big on that as well. So no fault on that part there. It does happen. People do do that, and then that's how they're able to, to, to support the, the work that they do. The people that preach there, they do not, they're not paid. 
uh, to do anything they do. They, they don't uh, take a love offering for the work they do unless they're considered a circuit overseer. Uh, they basically just become slaves to the organization because clearly the word of God said that the, the shepherd is, uh, the, is worthy of his hire. Uh, also, under the uh, Levitical law, God said that the priests were to be, were to, you know, that there would be a tithing given to them because their lives are dedicated to the service of God. But I can understand why no one would pay them because if it's not truth to begin with, you, uh, you shouldn't be paid in the first place. So in that case, there's a lot of other churches that should be in the same boat. They shouldn't be paid in the first place. Um, anyhow, though, let's, let's go back to the Word of God here. Uh, and the, the doctrine of hell is kind of interesting. I mean, we, I've gotten into this discussion many times with the witnesses. Uh, we go into the, the, the different terminologies, Haiti, uh, Hades, uh, uh, the Sheol, and uh, how Hades is the grave, etc. But the thing is, is there is a hell to shun. There is a heaven to gain. And when it comes to hell, one of the interesting ways that witnesses present this as a doctrine to try to get you to believe that hell doesn't exist is, a, is an analogy that they love to use and that is you're a parent, you're a father, or you're a mother and you have children and if you're that type of person, you're a parent and you have children, they like to ask you the question then say if your child is doing something bad, let's say your son was, was really bad, would you take start a fire, start the barbecue grill maybe, and just go stick his hand in that barbecue grill and burn him to teach him a lesson. Well, of course the answer is no. I mean, no, no parent would normally do something like that. I mean, you'd have to really have a warped mind to, to treat your children that way. Well, then comes the next part. Are you better than God? Do you think God is so cruel that he would take and burn his own children as well. Now, when, when Max first told me about this, I, I still remember this like it was yesterday. I thought it was funny. I said, are you kidding me? I said, that's the analogy you're going to use with me as far as me as a parent and sticking my own child's hand in the fire? I said, Max... That's the worst analogy I've ever heard. And it kind of floored him. And he said, what do you mean? I said, Max, I said, the word of God clearly says that he warned Sodom and Gomorrah for what they did. And he told them what they would have, what would happen to them if they didn't repent. He even sends the two angels down there when God himself stays behind with Abraham. And by the way, we know it's God himself because in the Hebrew language, Moses writes, yod heh vav heh. And by the way, Yeshua claimed to be the one that spoke to Abraham, not just spoke to him, but claimed to be the one that revealed the secrets of Sarah's heart. And the only one that revealed the secrets of Sarah's heart was God himself when he was in a human body right there. So don't think God can't become a man. That's for Jewish people as well. He can become a man because he can't became a man that day. He took on a human body that could eat a calf or eat the, lamb, the meat of the lamb and could drink the milk of, of, of the goat as well. So he did do it and he did come. And Yeshua claimed to be that guy, right? He claimed to be God himself standing before Abraham. But the point is, was here, then he sends the two angels down while he stays behind with Abraham. And those two angels go down there and they preach to Sodom to repent of their ways. And when they did not repent of their ways, God set fire and brimstone, burning rocks out of heaven and burnt those people up for not obeying his word. So, you cannot use that analogy. You have to understand, God, yes, He is a greater parent than what we are, but He's also a God of His Word. Now, who's to say that, you know, He, he gives you the opportunity. You have a choice. You either accept it and believe it, and He does everything He can to keep you from missing it, but it's just like it was in Egypt as well. When God had Moses go down, and one of the judgments was hail, and that hail came down, it, you know, you don't, you have to understand, God took also and swallowed him up in the sea, you know. So yes, he will, but he will burn the people. He also promised to send down hailstones on this earth at the end of the, at the very end of stones that would be a hundred pounds burning 
sulfur stones that will hit this earth in judgment and destroy the people on this earth. So now, but when it comes to hell, how long does hell last? Uh, some people say it's eternal. It's kind of hard to have an eternal hell because eternity means no beginning nor an end. And so therefore, the, the, the hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. And so the, there is a beginning with that. So, but how long does hell last? I don't know. Is it for eons of time? But there's a punishment. The Bible says the sin, the soul that sins, that soul shall surely die. So undoubtedly, eventually the soul no longer is in existence anymore. But how long the torture is of those flames for the evils that the people did on the earth and refused to repent, I have no idea. But that's clearly the word. And I know that's hard. I know nobody likes to hear that. And I'm not here to dangle you over hell with a brittle thread either. I just, but I got to tell you what the truth is. Okay. So, all right. So we, we've covered a lot of ground. Gosh, guys, we have covered a lot of ground and everything. And um, I want to take, though, and just share with you a few more scriptures, some of the scriptures that I use here in the book. Um, another one is Jeremiah 2. In his days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. Um, Yehovah, our righteousness. Um, we, the, the whole thing is, I mean, I could spend hours with you guys sharing with you the scriptures. Hosea is another one. And here's what's funny about Hosea. Hosea, if you go to chapter 5, let me take you to chapter 5. Well, I'll just go by memory. On chapter 5, God says in there, Hosea says to the people, uh, I, I will return to my place. And this is God himself speaking. He says to, through Hosea, I will re return to my place until you acknowledge your offense. And in your affliction, you will acknowledge me speedily. And he goes on to say, when you go into chapter 6, that's the last verse, by the way, of chapter 5, Come and let us return into uh, Hashem, the Lord, that is. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and in the third day uh, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Isn't that beautiful? And he wasn't talking about 24-hour days. Nothing happened 24 hours after that prophecy happened. One, he was talking about both houses going into captivity. And here we are. We're in the third day now. So that would be 3,000 years. We're almost 2,800 years later. And Israel, the house of Judah, is back in their homeland, according to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. The house of Israel will come back as well. I believe it's when the two witnesses uh, come on the scene. Uh, let's go, though, with 144,000. I just realized that I actually have not talked about that as of yet. 144,000. I'll kind of close with this. Maybe another time I'll come back and do another video, go a little bit deeper in some of these issues here. But the whole purpose for this video is to help uh, my friends that are that are Jehovah's Witnesses, that they might come out and recognize the era of the doctrine that they're in. Uh, many, many eras besides this, but just to give you some of the, some of the ideas. In Revelation chapter uh, uh, seven is where we find the hundred and forty-four thousand. Now, you remember, I said earlier that the witnesses believe that they are uh, that they are this particular group. Uh, well, actually, the anointed class that they have. Now, recently, I heard that doctrine has changed. Um, I don't know exactly what it's changed to, but I know that there's always, like I said, there's always changes coming up in this organization, which would set off a red flag for anybody when you have to constantly change your doctrine because it doesn't match what you're teaching. Um, John says here, uh, this is right after the six, I'm sorry, it's in the sixth seal, I believe still. And after these things, I saw uh, the four, four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel as ascending from the east, having the great seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay. 
Um, now, keep in mind, these angels are bringing the judgments of Almighty God. He's coming down to seal them just before these angels pour out these judgments on the earth. And he's going to seal this 144,000 of each tribe of Israel. And by the way, Dan is replaced and Ephraim is replaced in here, but Ephraim is replaced with Joseph. So basically all of Ephraim's children are still a part of it. But Dan is totally replaced here uh, in Revelation when the 12 tribes are mentioned and Levi is put back in his place as one of the tribes. Um, but each one of these are sealed and John recognizes the group that's being sealed. But they're actually being sealed right at the time when judgment is about to be poured out on the earth. That's not over the last uh, 100, almost 100 years that the uh, Watchtower Society has been an organization. These are actually alive and on the earth and they come and they get sealed just before judgment strikes. And by the way, we've only got three tribes back. That's according to scripture. Like I said, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7, the house of Judah returns first, but then God's going to bring back the house of Israel next. And they become, the, he takes the two sticks and binds them together as one and they'll no longer envy the other. So, the 144,000 has nothing to do with anybody that is part of the Watchtower organization. That's totally false doctrine to believe something like that. This is to Israel and to Israel alone. And now there is a number of people that no man could number uh, that John sees later. And, uh, and they're made up of every uh, kindred and tongue and tribe again. So you still see the Jewish people made up of those people there. But this is the remnant of Jews that will be part of Israel today. And the important thing is, and we'll read it again, verse 2, And I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God, and cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to what hurt the earth and the sea. I mean, we're talking about, you just saw the sixth seal. You just saw the earth being all shook up up here in chapter 6, verse 12. That's the ending of days right there. And they're about ready to sit there. Now they're about ready to go and wipe everything off. But that angel comes down and he says, hold on just a minute. I've got the seal, the servants of God in their forehead. See, he holds them back. Don't do it yet. Don't destroy this earth. See, watch, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Man, you're talking about some plagues going to be poured out. But remember, the house of Judah comes back first. You know why Judah comes back first? Because they're the ones that actually sold out Christ. Now, the Jehovah's Witness people, you're not the only ones. The Catholic Church, just as guilty of blaming the Jews for all the, the evils of the earth, blaming the Jews for the crucifixion of Yeshua. But you know who actually killed him? Yes, the Jews did condemn him because why? God had promised us in the word when Moses struck that rock on the first two weeks of the journey, when Aaron actually turned against his, uh, his brother Moses and sided with the people saying, would to God we'd have rather died in Egypt. He brought us out here to thirst us to death. And it angered God. So God tells Moses, go out, take the elders of Israel, judge, you know, go out there and smite the rock that it bring forth the, the, its waters. And that rock represented Christ. So God was already showing in a similitude and an example to us that Israel, it would be the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, that would be the ones that would judge him and smite him, that it brought forth its water. But had Israel not done what they did, my friends, had Israel not offered up Christ to be crucified, then there would be no eternal life for you to have either. And I know you're, you're, you're so against the Pentecostal people, and, and I don't say that, you know, let me tell you something. God is not just believing. In a way, you're kind of like a Baptist. you got to receive the Holy Ghost. Even the Baptists know you need to receive the Holy Ghost. I'm not saying you got to go speak in tongues. I know a lot of people believe you got to speak in tongues. Paul said, though I speak with tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, which is love, I'm just a tinkling brass and a sounding cymbal. You know? Now, Paul also said, I would that all of you spoke with tongues. You know? But the thing is, is... 
You need to receive the Spirit of God inside of you. That's what Yeshua came. That's what Jesus came to do, was to release the life of God. He, he just, I read to you a moment ago, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus claimed to be the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. He claimed to be, you know, when he breathed on the Nas, or breathed on the, his servants after his resurrection, he said, receive you the Holy Ghost. You know why he did that? He breathed on them to show them that he was the same God that was in the Garden of Eden that breathed in the nostrils of Adam. And when he breathed in the nostrils of Adam, he breathed the Chaim, God's own life in a plural form. And that man became a living soul. Isn't that interesting? And by the way, he never made man to rule over women. You know, you, 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 I mean, you guys, I can't knock you too much though because. The rest of the denominations are just the same way too. They, many of them believe that, you know, the women, they have to be submissive and they got to obey what we say. Look, you know, it's fine. I can't believe you guys actually believe some nonsense like that anyway. You know why? Because I'll tell you, you, you believe all these other organizations are false, but if you teach that women must submit themselves, by the way, the word's not even there in the original Greek, by the way. He does say submit to one another, but then they inject the word submit Wives, submit yourselves to your husband. It doesn't say that. See, that's another subject altogether. We've done a video on that. If you want to look that up, where me and my wife talk about that, we're going to go into it again much deeper. Um, but then, of course, you might say, well, the men are, were always a priest in the Bible, and, and it was the men that came up once a year to, to uh, three, excuse me, three times a year. It was always the men that had to come up to Israel for, for the different feasts that Israel had. It was never the women. You know why the men came up there? It was because God had already prophesied to Adam, by the sweat of your brow shall you bring forth. You know, the ground will not yield itself anymore to you. So when Israel made it to the promised land, they were still fulfilling the, the curse that God put on Adam. They were sweating by the, t tilling the ground by the sweat of their brow, and then they would bring their fruits unto God, the offerings that they would have, the first part of the harvest, and the men were required to do it because why? God said to Adam that that was going to happen. He prophesied to him, and that would happen. When he says to the woman, he says to her, he says, look, he says, you will turn to your husband. Tushutecha. Now, if you go get your strong concordance out, you're not going to see that it says turn to your husband. You won't see it there. This is in Paleo-Hebrew. When you go back even further to see how that the words were translated in some of the ancient manuscripts, this is where you see tushutecha means and you will turn to your husband. Do you realize he was talking to her one-on-one? -on -one? Do you realize, my little sisters that are Jehovah's Witnesses right now that are so faithful to this organization, do you realize God can talk to you one-on-one? -on -one? You don't have to have your husband, you know, I mean, did, did God come to, to Joseph first and then to Mary, got Joseph's permission to speak to Mary? No, he come to Mary first. He ended up having to go to Joseph because Joseph was going to put her away wrongly when this was a work of God. So he had to go to Joseph so Joseph wouldn't do something wrong. But God had a relationship with Eve, and that's what Yeshua come to restore, was that relationship that he had with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They had the fire of God inside of them. That's why they were called Ish and Isha, which literally means the fire of God, or the fire of, of Ye Yehovah, as, as we say. It was his own life inside of them was what made them. Okay, so when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was declaring that he was that tree of life. In fact, the Bible says in there, in Hebrew, it says, Ipach be'fav nishmat chayim. He breathed in their nostrils of breath, or in his nostrils of breath of life, but he does it in a plural form because Eve is in that body with him. She wasn't called Eve then, she's called Isha. So see, God actually made you equal, and he said that they both together would rule over and, and to take dominion over the earth. So they were co-rulers co of this earth. It's the fall that set everything out of cater. And of course, that's why we only have men priests, men apostles in the beginning, because until Yeshua could come and Israel, don't ever blame Israel, my friends. She played the part she had to. She did the job that you wouldn't do. 
Somebody had to be willing to offer up Yeshua as a sacrifice. Why? Because inside of him, he said he's the life. So inside of him was the tree of life. And the only way to, re to restore back the life that was lost at the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve's children could not receive eternal life. Why? Their children could not receive the, the Spirit of God. The fire of Hashem could not come inside of them. You know why? Because the sin that had came in caused the tree of life to be guarded now. And until God could make a way of redemption and make a body himself for himself to dwell in and, and, and make the world known to himself and come down here and, and give his own life in order to be able to allow his life to be poured out once again upon the people. Everything was out of cater. Even I know you guys have a doctrine. You don't believe that, you know, that, that all animals, when they die, they're just dead. Do you know the animals never sinned? In fact, that was another interesting thing because I remember Max telling me one time, he said, oh, no, Steve, he said, animals, God, God doesn't, animals are not in heaven. He said, in fact, deer in the Garden of Eden, animals actually died. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Max, you told me one time that you believe that the millennium is the same, that the way it will be in the millennium was exactly the way it was in the Garden of Eden. He said, that's exactly right. I said, well, it says clearly in the Bible, nothing shall harm nor kill in my holy mountain that the lion and the lamb will lay down together. Is that right? He said, yeah, that is right. I said, then there was no death in the Garden of Eden either then. There couldn't have been. That's contrary to the Word of God. See, in other words, when man sinned, all the nature is reaping the sins of man. But the nature didn't sin. They didn't do anything wrong. In fact, God gave them a command to multiply and replenish the earth. And they were, they were given that command and they weren't supposed to die. So do you think God is just in destroying them because of our sins? Think about that. And not to mention, you can't say animals are not in heaven. Jesus comes out riding on a horse. It talks about uh, the line of the, Oh, gosh. We, we could go into all kinds of things when it comes to that. So, you know, yes, animals... Uh, you know, now I do realize, I mean, there could be maybe an animal that dies and it goes into non-existence. Maybe that's so, you know, but they never sin, so they're not going to be tortured and punished, you know. Another interesting point as well. Why did Jesus walk on the water? He was showing that he was the same God in Genesis that brooded over the water, the face of the deep over in Genesis. Anyway, let's go real quick. One more thing I want to share with you because I know it's a big doctrine in, in the Watchtower organization. I know... Uh, this is in John chapter 1, and I'm going to close with this one here because I know I've probably kept you guys way too long as it is. John had, by the way, the greatest revelation, I believe, of Yeshua to be the Messiah or to know really who Yeshua was more than any other apostle, in my opinion. That's just my opinion on that. It says here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. Now, I know in the New World Translation, they translate that a God. And, uh, and that's kind of interesting because of the, the Greek word that is used there. You have, uh, I think that's Theos, if I'm not mistaken. And they say that's not God's divine name. What's well, kind of funny, if you go and look in, in the New World Translation and you start tracing all the places where this word is used here, was God, the word God here, uh, that is used in this case here, you will find that they actually have translated that as um, where it's actually used where it should be uh, God's divine name there. And then in those cases, they don't dare translate it as a God because they, you know, oh God, it's confusing when you see the way they do it. And of course, they use rules of uh, Greek that do not even exist. So any Greek scholar can easily debunk that. It does say, was in the word, was God. But here's how you can make it even more clear. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. There is your tree of life. Do you see that? In him was life. The tree of life was in the midst of the Garden of Eden as well as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Is that right? And in him, in who? 
the God that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, but at that time, he wasn't made flesh and dwelt. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that same God, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Remember what I said that Adam and Eve had in them? They had the fire of God. He was called Ish, she was called Isha. Aleph Yod Shin is how you spell his name. Hers is Aleph Shin He. The word Ash, fire, or light in this case, is in their names because their names have fire. And it's God's divine name. Yah, Yod He, Yah. Okay? So they have the fire of God in them. And we know this because God literally breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. Okay? Ipach Pe'av Nishmar Chaim. All right. So... Oh, gosh, let me take you real quick to this because this is so beautiful and I don't want you to miss this, especially if you guys have bared with me this long. Uh, maybe this will help you because uh, it identifies, it identifies who he is. Um, all right, let's, let's see if we find this real quick. This is in the creation uh, segment here. Uh, yeah, baby, okay. Uh, oh, my gosh, you guys. I actually, I'm getting something I haven't got before. So those that listen all the time, you're going to love this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Who did the forming from the dust of the ground? God himself did. This is, by the way, this is God's divine name. yod heh vav -He is how we spell it in Hebrew. See, ve yitzar Yehovah Elohim et Adam afar min haadama ipach beapav nishmar chayim veyahich Adam le nefesh chaya. God Himself was the one that breathed into the nostrils that breath of life, and John identifies here in Him was life. What life? It was God's own life was in Him, and God used. Yeshua, that body, which he wasn't Yeshua then because Jesus means salvation. He hadn't come to be a savior. Nothing was lost yet. So he was the word. He was God himself. He was the Logos in the beginning. And he breathed in that body called Adam. And he breathed God's own life from his own mouth into them. That's why Jesus breathed on his apostles and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He was the tree of life in the presence of his now his apostles, men and women, and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, just like he did in the Garden of Eden. Isn't that beautiful? That's hard to contain. And then it says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Of course. Okay? But, now here's what got me, though. When he said, In the beginning was the Word. So I remember going back to Genesis. I said, Okay, in the beginning. That means Bereshit. Bereshit means in the beginning, or at the first. So I went back to see for myself, what was the first word of God that was spoken by God? And you read, Oh, wow. That says there, And the Spirit of God, He hovered over the waters. That's why I say when Jesus walked on the water, why did He walk on the water? It was to show His apostles that He was the same God that walked on the waters when the earth was out for, form and void. Because John just said, in the beginning was the Word, and He created everything. So He was there walking on the water then. All right? And then He says here, oh gosh, it's so beautiful. Um, okay. Uh, pick up where I live. Okay. Alpane Hamayim. On the face, upon the face of the water. Okay. Then He says, Ve'yomer Elohim. That means, and God, He says, so here comes that first word. I'm fixing to hear God speak. Yahi or. Now, it's translated, let there be light. Yahi is eternity coming into existence. He was literally, in spirit form, was walking over the face of the earth. But now he's giving essence to the Shekinah glory, which is the light. Because remember, he says here, John says in verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The Choshech. Because the Choshech was on the face of the deep. 
Okay, darkness. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Then he goes into John and everything. But it's so beautiful because the scripture doesn't make any error whatsoever. None at all. And I could go into that deeper with you guys, much deeper. Anyway, I trust if you're a witness uh, with the Watchtower Society, if, if you've taken the time to watch this video, I pray this has been a blessing to you. I pray that you'll search the scripture. I could take you so many more scriptures, it's not even funny. Every, I mean, you can take and show me all you want that God uh, was tired of dealing with Israel. I know that. But when he swears that he'll bring them back, and also the scriptures that say not only that he'll bring them back, he said, but they will never be uprooted again. Israel's come home, friends. And they are going to be the remnant. There will be a remnant among them. I know that not every Jewish person in Israel is going to make it. That's actually, let me just share with you, just in closing. Let's, I'm sorry, I should have did this already. Romans 11. And I don't see, you can't get away from it. What does Paul say here in Romans 11? I say, then have, this is verse 11. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? See? And even, even Jesus himself says, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, he's going to turn back to the Jews. For I speak to you Gentiles insomuch as I'm, uh, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles and magnify mine office. If by any means I might provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the ch casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall, be, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? The receiving of them. And if some of the branches were be broken off and being wild uh, of a wild olive tree uh, were grafted in among them and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root. You can't say that they're not of God. I could take in so many deep things, brother, brother uh, friends that would be listening to this, that you it just blow your mind away. All you got to do is listen to other videos, you'll see. But I want to do this one for you, for your sake, and for those that are trying to help people to, to, to get away from the studying with these people. They might be good people from the outside, but the doctrine that they have is a damnable doctrine, and it's, it's just as bad as if you got into Catholicism. Anyway, to, to sum it up, though, let's drop all the way down to verse 24. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For behold, uh, for, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. So see, when you don't believe that God is going to regraft them in, Paul says you're being wise in your own conceits. You're being foolish, in other words. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Oh my gosh. Anyway, God bless you. Uh, God bless uh, those brothers and sisters that listen on a regular basis. I trust it's a blessing for you. I'm sure that, that it has been. Cause it blesses my heart just to get to talk to you. Anyway, good night. Baruch Hashem. Blessed, uh, blessed is the Lord. And Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless you and good night.